Today's episode is brought to you by Altoids because, let's face it, navigating the dating world isn't easy, but with Altoids, your breath will be stronger than the urge to text. You up? At 1 a.m. More intense than a rose ceremony and more reliable than your besties' questionable dating tips. Like, do the simple things. Make sure that you have fresh breath wherever you go, and you got to do it with Altoids. Altoids is your sidekick in dating. Do yourself a favor and make sure that you have fresh breath. There is no bigger turnoff than stale, stinky, rotten breath. It's also so easy because I feel like with gum, you always either, hey, have like a wrapper you got to throw away or God. you're like the gum gets nasty and you're like, where can I throw right. this gum it, away? Oh, with an Altoid, it's just so easy to throw in your bag. So easy to just have, dissolve in your mouth, chew it up, fresh breath immediately. Immediately. Altoids is the strong, reliable and intense boost of freshness that young professionals and single minglers need to be their authentic selves in daily life. When walking into a high stakes moment, if you have Altoids, your breath is one less thing you you have to think about when it comes to needing confidence and security to show up as your original self altoids has you covered they're not just mints they're curiously strong mints find altoids in the checkout aisles grab your tin today <laughs> What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another electrifying episode of the Vile Files Ask Nick edition. I am your host, Nick. We got a few members of the household and also really just everyone. I say household is in like, every, every, your, every, is that, is that, I mean, I felt like that was implied. Do, do listeners feel like they are part of the household? We, I feel like they are. They definitely like, do. We get writer inners all the time. Household like, member? As someone part of the household. Oh, amazing. Or, Great. Yeah. Anyways, welcome everyone. Welcome everyone to the household. Uh, we got Sweet Boy Justin. We got Scooter Magoo Scoot. with us. Uh, also, happy Fourth of July weekend! It's a good time to remind you guys that this week we got our Ask Nick episode because we, you know we we always need a little luck, like, a relationship reminder here and there. We got a reality recap tomorrow, uh, and then we're taking the rest of the week off. So enjoy your family, light some fireworks, stay safe, uh, drink responsibly, all that fun stuff. But uh, we'll be back next week with an absolute banger of a week. Uh, we got two reality recaps, an incredible going deeper. It's going to be one of those messy, messy jaw-dropping episodes. Uh, all right, what are we getting into before we got a writer in her? We do, but I will say fireworks aren't legal in LA, right? I have no idea. Like you no can't way. personally light a firework yourself. Is that true? You can't light fire. I mean, you, they sell, they're, uh, they're definitely illegal. Yeah, like I'm saying this in contrast to in NorCal, we can buy from a booth and then light it in our, like, what is it, like driveway. I don't know. My I'm dad not... set his roof on fire, lighting fireworks. Okay. Are they fireworks or gunshots that I'm hearing? Oh. No, I mean, people LA. definitely <laughs> do it still, but they're not Sometimes legal. I'm like, that's a firework. I'm like, or is it a gunshot? I don't know. I don't really know. <laughs> Some people do year-round fireworks as well. Difference. So. Well, if you drive into the state of Wisconsin, mm. boy, fireworks galore. That's year-round, right? Uh, and you could light it yourself. Again... <laughs> I have no, I am not a firework king or queen. Okay. I don't know much about them. They don't really get me off. They are the biggest scam. Yeah, I don't really care much for fireworks. They're wildly expensive. You could pay like $400 for one firework that's like the grand finale and it's like, what, five minutes? I Wasn't there know. a year where like all of the fireworks, somebody spent like thousands and thousands of dollars on fireworks and then they all went off at once? Yes. <laughs> my brother, yes. My, my brother does like a, like a, a show. He, yeah, he's, yeah. He's done a show before. Uh, which I guess is impressive. It's just tough because like, if you've ever gone to like a- A real show. No offense to my brother. A real show. <laughs> uh, it's hard to compare. Because well, that's when you have the ones flying into the sky and then like blowing up there. Yeah. As a young boy, I always fantasized by, uh, about collecting fireworks and then I grew up. Collecting and okay. then lighting them off? Just or? collecting Just like having them. <laughs> I remember like on Home Alone where uh, Kevin goes in, is, is, goes into Buzz's room and he opens up his secret chest and it has like Playboys and fireworks. <laughs> I feel like that's every young man's dream. Playboys and fireworks. Anyways, uh, we have a writer in her before we get to our calls. We do. All right. So we have a writer in her who wrote in, I don't want to change my last name. No, oh, so don't. Here we go. <laughs> this is what they say. Hi, Nick. I'm in a bit of a dilemma. My boyfriend, 27, and I, 26, are in the process of getting engaged. Oh, that's we like a, I'm falling in love. I'm in the, pro anyways, I'm in the process. Yeah, true. Okay. But anyway, oh, yeah, so they're talking about getting married. They're doing some process ring Process of getting engaged. Okay. okay. She's expecting the quesh. We've been looking at rings and everything. Oh, there we go. I truly love him and can't wait to be with him forever. Amazing. However, we cannot get on the same page about me changing my last name. 
I've always felt like I never wanted to change it, and that hasn't changed. I have a cool last name that was brought over when my family came to America, and they never Americanized it. I'm one of the only people left in my family with the name. It's my identity. I have my degree under that last name and have built a career off of it. My boyfriend says that it's really important for him for me to change it. I feel like I would be wiping my identity and he doesn't see it that way. A lot of my feelings stem <sighs> from <him>. how <laughs> a lot of my feelings stem from how it is historically since I'm not religious and it feels like ownership to me. People already would address us Mr. and Mrs. his first name, his last name, which I also have negative feelings about. He also said that he wants people to know we're together other than a ring. He also said he would be okay with me hyphenating it, but then we wouldn't have the same last name anyway, and I don't think he'd change his name for me. My compromise was me using socially and everywhere else, but not changing anything legally. Okay, that seems fair. That way people know we're together, but I don't have to lose my name. Also, the process of a name change is so daunting to me. We also don't plan on having kids, so I see no point. I told him it only makes sense to me to have the same last name as my kids, but since that isn't going to happen, I don't see why it matters that I take his name. Neither of us want kids anyway. Why does he care more about their feelings than me, his future wife's feelings? Who's they? Like the public. Like his friends and family. Oh, it's not I about, see. It's not about the public. It's about him. Yeah, it's not about... Like, when people say, like, oh, you care more about what other people think than what I think, it's more about... No, yeah, it's more about him and what he thinks other people might think, which is about him. It's how he's going to feel about himself. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, sometimes we allow public perception to influence how we feel about ourselves, but at the end of the day, it, it's about our feelings internally. You know, does that, yeah. does that make sense? It's not yeah. really about him caring. And also, like, just to play devil's advocate, to make my point, she cares what other people think about her last name. She's like, it sounds cool. You know, it's my identity. It's how people know me. Yada, yada, yada. I mean, like you're talking to a guy who just doesn't give a fuck one way or the other. Like Nally and I are married. I think Nally's always had the intention of like taking my last name. Technically, she hasn't yet. I don't even know. We we have we've been busy. We have a lot going on, like with work and our daughter and other priorities. That are, like we just haven't rushed to wherever we need to rush to get that changed. I haven't either, and it's been three years. <laughs> You, really? Oh. No, I haven't okay. changed it. Well, I, I kind of, I like her compromise a lot where it's like, cause that's kind of how I've been. I changed my last name on Instagram. And when people say Mrs. Silberstein, it doesn't bother me at all. Like, sure. But legally I haven't changed it. I've already kind of, I don't know, my email. It's just, it's a whole thing. I do understand for her where she has family importance for her name too. Cause like for me, I'm the last son like in my generation or like in my family line to carry on the name and like my family migrated here too so it's like i understand her fear of saying it's daunting to change the name but i also mm -hmm. think hyphenating it is like a simple solution yeah I know. oh my god absolutely no i could not <laughs> really? be more anti-hyphenated that is the i can't having your name hyphenated just screams and if you're listening and you've hyphenated sorry it's just a it's just one man's opinion you know. I think it's pretty to have two last my names. Last oh name my last name would God. be like 25 letters. It kind of, to me, screams high maintenance and you're a pain in the ass. It kind of screams Karen. <laughs> it's giving we're bougie, I guess. Yeah. It, it, it's giving it, it, this it's, wouldn't fit on any document. Yeah. It's just like, it's true. It's, true. <laughs> For me, at least. It's giving you're going to correct me on something. I don't know. It's just not for me. Pick one. Also, I've, I've, uh, well, they're not having kids, but I've run into people who are product of hyphenated names and I, they, those kids feel very, the hyphenated kids feel very passionate about wishing their name wasn't hyphenated. Oh, interesting. interesting. Uh, I've had a handful of conversations with kids who come from hyphenated parents and they, it, there's some trauma <laughs> simply based off of them having two last names. Uh, so pick one. You just made me think, solution. So my parents were going to hyphenate their name, but then my dad didn't want to. So I have two middle names. My second middle name oh, is yeah, my well, mom's maiden mm -hmm. name. Okay. So yeah. maybe her solution is just take that. one of the names off. Well, it's I, I have a lot of friends who did that. It's interesting yeah. that she thought her compromise was to like uh, socially take his name, but legally not. I almost thought maybe the other way around. Oh. Maybe to compromise, and, and this is an advice for both of you, just try empathizing with the other person's point of view. Right now, they're so unwilling to like, 
concede anything for fear that they're going to have to compromise. They're, they're not even, and that's problem, the problem with like, you know, a lot of times in fights, we are so afraid to put ourselves in the other person's shoes because we have to, we feel like we're already conceding something or we're going to give in. Now, you also don't want to be the, oh, oh, the one person is always willing to put yourself in the other person's shoes when they're not. So there's that. But like, just to put, just for argument's sake, not to agree with him at all, but just like, listen, empathize with the fact that like, right or wrong, historically, it is something that has, uh, you know, I think, feel, you know, it's not an ownership thing is a sense of like, I've never expected Natalie to take my last name, nor do I like think my last name is like something people, you know, it's the opposite of cool. But knowing that Natalie was willing to do it, like it felt good. It was just like, yeah, you know, made her, it, it wasn't about the name. It wasn't about the aesthetic. It wasn't about, you know, anything is that like she wanted to because it made her feel more connected to me and, and my wife. That That's just a personal opinion on Natalie. Would you have taken her last name? Like, I always wonder if, if you have two last names, right? And one of them is like just way swaggier than the other. I would like to believe I would, but I probably. Well, I wonder why that's such I, a thing, because it's like it's like you're still taking your partner's last name, right? And you're becoming a family together with the same last name. So I just always wonder, like, why does it have to always be? I mean, listen, I kind of wish my dad took my mom's last name. Like Nick Parker is a lot cooler than the. Oh yeah, my mom's now. maiden name is way cooler than yeah. my last name. There is something that some people do where they switch the names too. So like the man takes the woman and the woman takes the man or whatever. Oh, partner. I don't like that because then they still have two different last names. Yeah, but then it's like you're like proud to take on your partner's name. I think if they were going to have kids, then. I would say for the sake of the kids, like legally, it would, you know, like I will say like Nally hasn't taken my last name yet. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, we enjoy calling each other husband and wife. And so there's been a few times like checking into hotels or whatever, where like we have two different last names and it feels like I, 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 I'm compelled to want to be like, but this is my wife, not my girlfriend or fiance. Yeah. And have you experienced no. <laughs> moments like that where you almost feel like, no, but we're married? Well, I had a really annoying experience yeah. where Danny and I married, we lived together and we needed to get parking permits on our street, but the lease was under his last name. And so I went in to get these parking permits and I had already been there for hours waiting and I finally get to my turn and they're like, you're not so, like you don't have the same last name i'm not giving you your last yeah. name is globerman i can't give you a parking permit for the street yeah and so that's I, why i had I, to be carried out of there i was so angry like like legally i feel like uh whatever benefits i think it can cause some like annoyances or yeah. hassles and no i can imagine that now like i'm having a kid and my name is still globerman and my it's kid's name is going to be silberstein and that's gonna I don't know. What, you might want to change that. I probably need to change my name yeah. pretty soon. Um, <laughs> so also question, I don't know the answer to this, but like, could you legally change your name and then professionally maintain? Yeah, a lot of people do that. Yeah, because a like, again, the, and I say legal, I guess legally sounds official and strong and more like you're you're giving up more by legally changing. Also, you can- It's legally, your social security. You it's can legally change everything. it back. But like, to me, that's why I say legally change it, but socially keep it. Because to me, socially matters more, you know, like you can use it at your discretion, like on social media. So, you know, don't change your last name. You could put married to, you know, your husband. Um, you go to work, you know, keep your professional last name. Like it's just on a document level. That's why I say change it legally, because there's going to be a lot of situations when you get married. The fact that they're not having kids, I think, is going to complicate it less. But there are going to be other situations where it just might be a lot easier to have the same last name. Mm -hmm. But socially, for your aesthetic and for people, you know, and like the sense of pride and maintaining it, like you're not having kids. So you're not passing the name down to anyone. So who gives a shit about that? To, so I guess to me, in my brain, it makes more sense to legally change it and socially keep it because socially keeping it means that like, you know, if she's saying, oh, legally, uh, I don't want to do it, but socially, what she wants, she wanted to socially. Yeah, she was saying that my compromise was me using socially and everywhere else, but not changing anything legally. So she wanted see, to keep her name legally. That, that, that does, see, that to me doesn't make sense because it's the name that she likes. She likes being referred to as Lois Lane, you know, like it sounds nice. Fire name, yeah. Right? <laughs> and so if she were to legally 
uh, not change it, but socially keeps him, all, all of a sudden she's referred to as Lois Bartholomew or whatever. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? And it's just like, yeah, it sounded so much better when I was Lois Lane. So doesn't she want people to still call her Lois Lane? Because if legally, who gives a shit? Like, you know, people have like legally Tom Cruise's name isn't Tom Cruise. I just wonder why her husband like, is not accepting that compromise then. I mean, because like, I, I, it, it, it's still a tradition that I think despite us being more progressive and changing some of the rules, like it's not meant from an owner. Sense. It's like, I, again, it's like it feels good to be with someone who who is proud to be in a relationship with you. And I understand it, can go, it goes both ways, but I don't think a guy uh, wanting to have his wife take his last name immediately means he's some sort of misogynistic, mm. you know, asshole who's only getting married because he wants to feel like he owns his partner. I don't think that's the case for most men, yeah. you know? So I think hyphenating is a solution because then you can choose. So, because <laughs> then you can choose. Like no I, way. <laughs> I think it's a cool thing because you can also choose in what situation which last name you want to use. But it's a win-win. Again, in my eyes. I don't have experience in. I find I I have an opinion, but I have talked to hyphenated kids, and they have a very strong opinion about okay. how annoying it is. My kids wouldn't be able to fill out their SATs. I mean, I had that issue with my two middle names, but like you survive. You just choose which one you want to abbreviate in what scenario. But you don't really have to put your full middle name on. I don't know. I think I, mean, a lot of I think my solution's pretty solid, and I think if she sees it differently, because she can then give him what we want, he wants legally take his last name. I wonder if he'd be okay knowing, with that, though. Knowing you can legally change it back. If I wonder um, if he would accept that, though. Like, I am curious to know if she presented that compromise. If like he would at be work, okay I want to be well because, like, it's not like he goes. He doesn't take her to work, you know. So, like at work, keep your keep your last name on social. Who gives a shit? You know, keep your last name in the spaces that you want to keep your last name, keep your last name. But like as a couple, when you travel or do documents together, it's going to be fucking annoying. And when you meet strangers, like no one gives a shit that your name's Lois Lane, but you're going to care more that people think you're married. And it's always going to be kind of annoying when people like when you're going to have to explain that you're married. I do understand the sentimental Part of it, though, like my sister, for example, doesn't want to change her last name because she had a really strong relationship with my dad who passed away when we were young. And she really feels connected to the last name Globerman. Mm -hmm. And so she doesn't want to change it. OK. Yeah. And her husband's and, and, cool with it. But I so she never changed it. Like I get I get feeling sentimental about your last name. I'm not, and not here wanting to convince to anyone it. that they shouldn't want to not change their last name. You know, this I was just trying to figure out the like. This isn't about like should she shouldn't she or should she like yeah. whatever she wants to do she is entitled to doing. I again you're talking to a guy who doesn't really have a strong opinion about it. Mm -hmm. If Nally was like, listen, I really want to keep my last name, I've been like, yeah, okay. I I think after you get you know again she hasn't we ha she hasn't changed her last name and I haven't been like we should do this like yeah. I you know it's bit we've already run into situations where it's been kind of inconvenient and annoying for her for us to have a different last name. What happened? I mean, just like little things. Okay. Nothing really mm -hmm. big, you know, it's just more like, it's like, oh, we should, do, like, that's reminding us to do it. Yeah. But not such a big deal that we've done anything about it. You know, like a minor pet peeve. It's just mm -hmm. like, you know, it's like a whole thing. And again, it's, that's more when we are, when we are in, like, around strangers who don't know us, who don't know anything about us. Like, I, I like knowing that people immediately assume we're husband and wife because we are. Yeah. And I don't want to, I don't want strangers to assume that we're not. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? So that's like, and so that's what I'm suggesting legally change it because when you encounter strangers, you're not going to care if people like are referring to you to your cool last name. You're going to care more that people think you're married, assuming you're happily married. Uh, and then socially for the people who already know you, for the people you work with, for the people you hang out with, you can still be Lois Lane. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You don't have to change anything, you know? So at work, when you're meeting with clients, Lois Lane, you know, you your emails, reaching out to people, you can email that power name, Lois Lane. I'm you know, assuming, you know, to me that that makes more sense. And I think that actually in reality, based on what I'm hearing her needs and desires are, to me that actually fits those needs more than the opposite of what she's trying to do. I just hope that he's willing to compromise because this would, this would piss me off. So I feel for her because it's just like, it should just be... Well, fine, but to get him to compromise, isn't is to do that, isn't accusing him of being misogynistic or no. telling him he's being a certain way. It's trying to empathize with why he feels the way he does. And I'm pretty sure it's not because he wants to own you. 
And if you think that, you shouldn't marry the guy. He might have family like importance with his name too. Sure. Yeah. 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 No, it's about hearing, yeah, listening, hearing him out, figuring out what it is about the last name change that's so important to him and then coming up with a compromise together that makes you both happy. I, because what I'm hearing is that in the circles that I already operate before I met you, before I knew you and I had my job, I'm, I've been this person, I'm, a, I'm known as this person and I want that to maintain. She can still do that by socially keeping her last name in the spaces that he's not really involved in, like work, you know, or with certain friends, maybe even on social. But when they do business together or travel together or interact with strangers, they're going to want to have the same last name. And when you fly or you make reservations, you know, you're going to have to put your legal last name and then you're always going to have to explain to people that you are in fact married. Yeah. No, hundred percent. I just, we just filled out like our pre-registration for the hospital mm-hmm. for when I go into labor and I had to like do a separate form for Danny because we have two different last names. Yeah. And on your child, like on our child's, on River's birth certificate, it's like we have two last names and we had to like, we weren't actually buried at the time she was born. So it was a little different, but, um, so yeah, I don't know. Let us know in the comments what you think. Uh, I have an idea. What's up? Everybody in the household, we should hyphenate our names to include by all. You're still. Phillips by all. <laughs> this episode Leigh is Gorman just going to be called. Justin <laughs> wants you to hyphenate. I will say I thought <laughs> about it. your name. Hyphenation is an issue because if there's two people with hyphenated last names, is there just four last names? Right. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Imagine. Oh, my God. Yeah. So Imagine. you're right. Oh, Later what a mess. The line. What a mess. <laughs> oh, my God. That would be such a mess. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, we got some great calls lined up for you. But before we do, don't forget to send in your questions at asknickatthefilefiles.com. Remember, we just have Reality Recap tomorrow, and then we are taking off for the holidays. So do the same, but still tell your friends about this amazing show. All right, let's get to our callers. What's your time with Nick? Let's ask Nick your sexy questions. How's it going? Hi, how's it going? Good. What's your name? I'm Olivia. I am 32 years old. I just got laid off and I'm spiraling and having second thoughts about my wedding. Okay. Well, I'm sorry that you lost your job. That, that absolutely sucks. Like, I don't want to sit there and diminish what that might feel like uh, and the fears that can come with it. That being said, when it comes to a relationship, I guess of any kind, friendship or romantic, I think the hope in those relationships is, and why we're a big part of why we're in relationships, or at least why I'm in a relationship, is to have that support system in times of crisis and fear and the unknown. And my question to you is, why at this time um, of losing your job, that uh, instead of having the feeling of, thank God, at least I I have my rock, my fiance, my soon-to-be future husband, why is you being laid off from your job making you second-guess your relationship in general? Yeah, I think right now it's just, I was so excited about this job that I got. And I felt like it was finally like the culmination of all of my previous jobs and experience all put together in one. And I was super thrilled about it. And when I got the job, I ended up getting engaged within the same week of starting that same job. So my fiance proposed on that Saturday of me starting this new job. And while I was super excited, I was also very anxious about everything because, you know, it's a brand new job. It's a it was like my first salary job too. So I just thought that I'd finally found my place after um, I've been out of college for 10 years now. And so I finally felt like I found this exciting new opportunity and kind of this new role that I was going to excel in and I had opportunities in. And so then being thrown into like the pressure of wedding planning all at the same time, it just felt like so much for me. I felt anxious. I felt scared, you know, having to feel the pressure of wanting to look a certain way, but also excel in this new role. And I was also experiencing some health issues, trying to like plan this wedding on top of it. I think I just kind of crumbled under the pressure. And now that I've lost this job, I've lost my income. I'm starting to think about my mental health and my, my headspace of where I'm at and just feeling so like I'm, I'm struggling and spiraling and suffering from, you know, anxiety and depression and now putting a, a marriage on top of that. I'm just, I don't feel like my best self. Okay. That's and fair. I don't think my, yeah, I don't feel like my fiance deserves to be with someone that is, you know, more so 
feeling like I'm in an identity crisis and not know where to go from here. Okay, well, let's let's work through this. There's probably a, a better therapy term for this or something like this, so, <laughs> which I'm not, and so I don't know it. Yeah. But maybe projecting, I know is the word, I don't know, but you're kind of conflating or you're, you're taking your work crisis and allowing that to fill you with self-doubt about everything in your life. Now, Absolutely. I haven't asked you any questions about your relationship. I know nothing about it. For all I know, you're about to describe it and it sounds like, oh my God, your partner's terrible and holy shit, why are you in this relationship? And like, maybe this was a wake up call. So far, you haven't really described that. The only thing you said about your partner right now is that he doesn't deserve yada, 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 yada. And I guess when people say things like that, when we talk about what our partners don't deserve, other than in like the obvious of like, well, your, my partner doesn't deserve to be like treated a certain way. Like, like let's say you, you call up and you're like, I call my partner a fucking asshole every day. You know, if you were to say to me, my partner des- doesn't deserve that, you and I would agree. I wouldn't question you. I'd be like, yeah, you should probably stop that. When we say our partner's don't deserve someone who's, you know, confused or insecure about themselves or questioning X, Y, or Z. Like, who are we to say what our partners don't and don't deserve? Like, I kind of think it's a cop out to be, to be honest. Like we can, again, we can dive into your relationship and, and, and take some time to figure out like where you're at versus your job. But I'm assuming when you entered it, I, I, don't, I don't know when you made like a list, maybe you didn't make a list, but when you think about what you want out of a relationship, Right. Most mm-hmm. people think about that. And I'm assuming, I don't know if you've ever done that exercise in your head, but I'd be willing to guess that when you are talking with your girls or any are talking to anyone, if they were to say, well, what do you want in a relationship? You would, you know, somewhere along the lines, you would say, well, I really want someone that I can lean on in hard times who can be my rock, especially when I'm, when I'm feeling the most insecure, they, they bring me security. You know, obviously we can't make other people feel confident. We have to be confident ourselves and yada, yada, yada. But like, there's a reason why we have support systems because our support systems are there to stop us from falling. So, or pick us up when we're, when we're feeling weak, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And it's kind of a cop out to just for, to dismiss your boyfriend's role. And I'm guessing there's a chance that he quite literally did sign up for this. My favorite thing in the world to do is to take care of the people I love. And most specifically, my wife, Natalie, and my daughter, River. It is my favorite thing. That doesn't mean I am wishing problems and sadness upon Natalie and my River just so that I can step up and save the day. But I literally did sign up for that. I literally signed up to be there for them when they need me most. And hopefully, like, that's few and far between. But I did sign up for that. And Mm -hmm. there's a world in which if you're fiance was here today, he might agree and say like, no, I, I literally, I'm, that's, that's why I want to be with you. I don't want you to be sad or depressed or anything, but I literally did sign up for these moments. That's how I show love. It's li- like acts of service, like, you know, to be there for your partner and step up is, is a potential opportunity for your partner to, sh- to show a love language. Right. And it's an opportunity for you to feel his love in this time of need. All I know right now is you have connected the dots between getting engaged in this dream job that you got. Yeah. You know, you got the dream job. Your boyfriend saw it as a sign of like, you know, that's why we get engaged, especially in 2024. We're planners, you know, it's mm-hmm. like back in the day. It's like, I love you. Let's get engaged. Great. Let's figure out our life. Holy shit. I, I'm poor. You know, that, that's what our parents did. Now it's like, well, what's our 15 year plan? Like we'll get engaged when we all have our jobs and we'll have kids when we can afford right. it. And once we have our college, once we have the, our college fund saved for our four kids who don't exist, then we can start having children. Like I'm, I'm a bit exaggerating, but that's yeah. kind of the mentality yeah. we've gone to. I know what you've set in your head. I know that I, I got a version of the story you've created in your head, but like, let's figure out what the real truth of your situation is. You know, like you lost your job. Fine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Did that open up your eyes to problems that your relationship existed? Or are you just spiraling and you are now doubting yourself and your relationship because the job that you thought was endgame for you, a job that you thought like, finally, finally, I have a job that's not just a job, it's a career. And trust me, I, oh, right. well, I'm a God, I can empathize with that. You know, I think a lot of people your age and in your shoes can, you know, especially nowadays. And so we go to college, we spend all this money, even more money now, you know, than I, when I went to school, right? And we get this education and then there's always these questions about well, like, was it worth it? You know, what did I really learn? Yada, yada, yada. Then we get this job. Now this job sometimes is the job that we thought that we always wanted. 
you know, or sometimes it's a job that we just take because, well, hell, I just need a job. And oftentimes in your 20s, you have these various jobs that you wish felt like a career, but just feel like a job, you know, and right. sometimes these jobs are what you planned on. And then you're like, you, you know, for example, I was an accountant and I was an accounting major. My first job, I was like, I fucking hate this shit. I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. Holy fuck, you know? Yeah. And then I had to figure it out. I, you know, I, I thought, oh, you know, it was like, I thought I was going to be a teacher. Then I got into sales. I like sales. I had to work my way up. Even my sales career, my first couple sales jobs, my first sales job was selling cell phones. You know, I had no sales experience. I don't want to do that for the rest of my life. It felt like a job. Then I moved up on in that company, but then I was like, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. And then I got a job in, in, in medical supplies. And I was like, this doesn't feel like a career. It was like, it was a really good job for in terms of work-life balance versus what I made versus how much I had to work. And my boss lived in Kansas City. And I was like, I kind of did whatever the fuck I want. But I, here I was, I was like right. 31 years old. I'm like, I'm not really developing any skills. I'm not working with people. Like, yeah, I have a cushy job and I had making decent money, but my upward, like, I don't, this isn't a career. Like, you know, and then finally I got a job, you know, where it felt like, I can make something of this. And it was, oh my God, the weight off my shoulders where you finally feel like, oh, I, I, I see the opportunity here. And I don't just have this job. I see all the possibilities of what my next five jobs could look like through the opportunities this position right. offers, which is, wow, like what a feeling. So I can relate to that feeling. And for you to have lost that job recently, I can imagine the mind fuck that is. So I completely empathize. Yeah, thank you. No, I think too, it was the way that it happened. It was out of nowhere. I was given no severance. I had been meetings like that morning before they Zoomed called me and laid me off or fired me or whatever. They didn't give me a single reason. I asked why my answers that I wanted, they weren't um, able to give me. So yeah. it's like, there's no closure there. There's nothing. There was no reason given to me as to why I was being let go. I mean, and it might, might probably could be a already, downsizing situation, could it not? Yeah. I mean, I, it just sucks because I don't know. The company is pretty small. So I don't believe there was anybody else on my team, at least, that was let go because there was only like six of us on my team. There was no leadership either. They were going through like a brand new like executive team, like bringing on CEOs and, you know, the whole C-suite was being revised, if you will. So I think maybe just because I'd only been there like, six months, I was just kind of the easiest cut. You Could know, be to that be too. Go. Listen, it sucks, right? And just like a breakup, yeah. you know, it's like, I know that with a job, it's a little different. You're like, you actually want a little constructive feedback. It's like, hey man, I, I just want to be right. like a better employee. So like if I did something that I need to correct, let me know. I suppose like with relationships, that's somewhat helpful, but like in a romantic relationship, we're not looking for someone to give us constructive feedback in that moment. We say that we want it, but we don't really want that. You know, like, well, you could kind of be less of an asshole. It's like, oh, okay, well, thank you for the feedback. I'll, I'll work on that. But in a job, yeah, you, you kind of want that feedback a little bit. But the reality is, is, well, maybe you know now, in the corporate setting, you know, like there's so many like HR rules and policies and laws. Yeah. And like from a legal standpoint, if they fire you for cause, then you could argue that. Right. Well, they if, said it was just at will, like they can let exactly. you go for any reason, basically. It, well, yeah. it, well, I'm just saying that is why you're not getting the closure that you want. It's because you were hired right. as an at yeah. will employee. And if you, they were to fire you for cause, then you can argue against why they fired you. If they fire you because it's like, hey, we just don't have the work for you or like we don't really have a reason. There's just like the job we thought we had for you. We're just going in a different direction. Then you can't argue that. That's just like an internal right. decision. I know that's annoying and frustrating. But instead of beating yourself up emotionally, like, listen, do the net, do the exercise that anyone who legitimately wants to be a better employee should do, which is like, what do you think? If you were to give yourself a self-review, what would be some things that you think you should work on? Yeah. I think it's part of the bigger picture of why I'm experiencing all these feelings is, is like, I know that I have experienced really severe anxiety okay. and I have never been medicated. Um, I actually was trying to work through that with a doctor really close to getting let go. And then it just never, I never followed through with it. And um, then I got let go and lost my insurance. So I think that was part of it is like feeling really anxious during the job, not knowing there was no like tr formal training. I was learning the best I could from coworkers because I had no real boss at that point either. So I was full of self-doubt and I was, I feel like pretty 
honest with my team about that, which obviously looking back, I probably shouldn't have been as honest that I was like needing more help or maybe I should have put on more of a brave face. I don't know, but maybe, um, yeah, that might, that that might be honestly was the best policy. You never listen. There's like, it's, I, I don't work at that organization. I don't know what their goals are as an organization. I don't know the type of people they, they set out to hire when they hired a bunch of people, any small organization for the most part that's growing or has aspirations of growth is understaffed. Like there's more work to be done than they have people doing it, right? You may have had a job or two uh, or like your job title had a bunch, you you know, a a bunch of roles and responsibilities, but in a small organization that's just like, they're looking for people who are fast learners, easy adapters, problem solvers, yada, yada, yada. uh, And someone who can kind of figure it out on their own, which you know, just saying that out loud, like that is not the easiest atmosphere to be a part of, you know, like a lot of people would struggle in an atmosphere like that. And maybe you in fact struggled, like that doesn't make you a bad employee. It doesn't mean you can't even improve on that, but like maybe you could just say, Hey, listen, despite it being like, it's almost one of those things where, you know how, like when we, people call in all the time and they talk about like, you know, they'll call it and say like, "I'm, I'm questioning my relationship. I know that you're kind of mentioning that too, but for different reasons, like my boyfriend, like I'm thinking about breaking up with my boyfriend or, or more accurately, they might say like, I'm having problems with my partner, but I really love them and I really love him. And he's my dream guy, yada, yada. And I start asking them questions and I'm like, well, maybe you thought they were your dream guy, but you're talking about him right now. And it doesn't sound like the way you describe them. They're actually your dream guy. Right. So like, I, I guess what I'm saying is you said, well, I had this dream job and yada, yada. And I don't doubt that when you got that job, you thought this was your dream job. How long did you work at that job? Only like six and a half months. Okay. Six and a half months. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, well, I'm question yeah. to you is like at any point in month three, four or five, did it ever feel like not a dream job? Yeah, totally. I, I was really frustrated that I had no leadership. I had only had one positive like performance review too. So the fact that that they couldn't give me any answers or thought maybe it was a loot, you know, like related to my performance. That's why I also felt confused, but just, it was a change in schedule. They would change my, you know, in office days versus hybrid days. Um, it was affecting my workout schedule. Just, you know, they would add on these like happy hours that were mandatory to go to. Cause it was all about like networking with, you know, the people that we were supposed to be working with, et cetera. So yeah, it, it turned into a lot of these extra curricular things that I needed to go to and commitments that I didn't realize were part of the, the job. And totally just a lot more stress, lack of structure, no formal training, just trying to learn the best that I could for my coworkers. And I didn't think that was fair to not be, you know, have any sort of leadership besides trying to learn the best I could for my coworkers. So yeah, I was pretty miserable, honestly, from what I thought was supposed to be this wonderful opportunity. There you go. Have you ever actually admitted that to yourself or anyone else that you were actually pretty miserable at this job? Uh, yeah, my fiance and I have definitely talked about it. And he's even brought that up like in conversations when he's trying to like talk me down and make me feel better. He's like, no, I saw the way it affected you and even just your mood. And okay, I mean, but it's like, affected so many parts of my life. So yeah. he's your fiance. Again, the person who it sounds like did sign up for this to be there by your side. And it sounds like that's what he's trying to do. But if you actually mm-hmm. take in stock and actually let that sink in. And when our partners or the people closest to us try to do that, we're, we, we're very quick to dismiss them because, you know, they say it all the time. Yeah, yeah, whatever. You know, I don't want that right now. And maybe you're just in the season of like wanting to like feel sorry for yourself, which you're entitled to do, which is a part of the mm-hmm. grieving process. And losing a job is something to grieve over. But I'm saying, have you yet to really take stock in the fact that you were in fact miserable? You know, have you said, Olivia, wow, you really fucking hated that job. I'm actually glad I don't have to go into work today. Yeah, I'm worried about my job. Yeah, I'm worried about money. But like, let's just be real here, Olivia. You fucking hated that job. And thank God you're not going in today to do the job you actually fucking hated because the job I accepted was not the job it ended up being. And you have to remember when you interview a job, yeah, you're selling them and you're giving them the like the best version of yourself. And when you're asked, like, you know, what's a 
what's a bad habit of yours? You're finding, you're trying to figure out the most clever way of saying I'm a perfectionist, you know, without, mm -hmm. without having to say that, right? But a company, right. especially a small company, a growing company is also selling you on the job too. They're also trying to make it seem like this job is your dream job and yada, yada. And like, it, the truth is always somewhere in the middle. And like, not that they were being disingenuous, but like maybe they could have been more upfront with the type of person they're looking for. It's like, hey, we really need someone who's good with not a lot of direction, who's very self-starting, who can manage a lot, like, I'll be honest, this job can be very stressful and we're looking for people who can manage that stress. Also, to be honest, like we're looking for someone who like are incredibly career driven. And let me be clear before you say, oh, I'm career driven too. Like there are going to be several times and in instances where like a situation is going to arise and you might have plans and the expectation is you're going to have to cancel those plans and get the job done. I doubt they said that in their interview, but it sounds like that's what it ended up being. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, they're not going to give you the benefit of the doubt, obviously, when they're like evaluating if they hire the right person for the job or not. Right. And like, just like the person in a relationship who, you know, thought their partner was an asshole and didn't treat them right and doesn't remember the last time they made them happy. But when they get broken up with, we like to forget all that and still act sad over the person that we knew we didn't deserve. And yet we're sad because they broke up with us. And like, you know, you got fired. So it's really hurting your ego and it's really affecting your self-worth and it's making you question. And instead of focusing your energy where it should be, which is evaluating the job that you had, you are forgetting how you felt about the job and you are selectively only remembering how you felt when you were first offered that job. Pretty accurate. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So like, how do yeah. we get you to reassess before you blow your whole hot life up? Now we can yeah. talk about your relationship, but now the obvious question is, is like, are you just using this job as an excuse for a relationship that deep down you're also not happy with and you just don't want to be honest with that? Or is this really you allowing this job to shatter all your self-confidence about who you are as a person and, and making you doubt. It's like now you're connecting the dots between like, I thought this was my dream job. It ended up not being the dream job. Well, how do I know I know this is not my dream person and yada, yada, yada. And should I get to marry him? And my question to you is it's a real simple exercise. Just like we talked about earlier, like you got offered a job. You thought it was your dream job. Six months into the job, you, there are several examples if you were to go back and reflect and think about it, where it was like, in fact, this job wasn't your dream job. It was the literal opposite of it because like you have different needs than the job required. And you realize that without, without it being able to admit in the moment, you now realize it wasn't my dream job. Well, my question to you about your relationship, how do you feel about your partner? Are there several instances where you're like, he doesn't treat me nice. He doesn't make me feel good, yada, yada. And that's making you question it. Or are you just like doubting yourself just because of this job? It's kind of what you said. It's more so all of the self-doubt and spiraling into thinking, well, this one thing has gone wrong in my life and I haven't figured out the, you know, the health issues I was experiencing. And I kind of had to give up on that, especially since I lost in my insurance. And then, you know, I wanted to go to therapy, but now I don't have insurance and whatever. And it's like, okay, but now I'm about to supposed to be making a lifelong commitment to someone. And am I really in the best headspace to be able to do that when I am like absolutely miserable and anxious and having anxiety attacks and crying? <laughs> you know, it, it's like, I think I'm just having on this like self-destructive path, unfortunately, where I'm just trying to tear everything down in, in like a that makes sense. response or something. But I mean, my fiance, he is incredibly supportive and has been even taking up like a second job to pay for this wedding, which it's incredible, but also it's kind of, it, it sucks too, because then at night, like we don't spend time together because he's gone and I'm just left to like, think of my own, let my mind run, you know, like I'm just idle hands are the devil's play things they say. Sure. And I'm, I'm just sitting around thinking about all these things in my life and it, like you said, kind of feeling sorry for myself because it's still so fresh that um, I haven't been able to emotionally pick myself back up yet and get back out there and figure out my next steps. How long ago did you lose your job? Uh, two weeks. Okay. So it's still pretty raw, still pretty yeah. fresh, but yeah, sounds like you've never really acknowledged the power that you have, which is I can actually stop thinking about this if I want to. Yeah. I don't know anything about your life story up until now. Maybe you've had some really difficult times in your life. I'm sure you've had some happy times. I'm not here to 
oversimplify your life. But like you've gotten this far, you you are engaged. It sounds like to a pretty good guy. You got your looks, you got your youth, you know, like you got a lot, you know, like I don't know what your family support system is. I'm looking at the little bit of your back room. It seems like a nice, pretty nice place. So like you can say, Olivia, I know times are scary right now. And I know like this did not work out the way I hoped, but like, it's going to be okay. Like we're going to figure it out. You know, like you can say that to yourself and it can be true because you've figured out things in the past. You've had crises in the past. You've, you've been surprised by people. People have disappointed you. You've been sad. You've been insecure before and you've figured it out. Yeah. Just to speak on the family part, my parents and my grandma were out here last week because they just happened to be out here anyway because my cousin graduated from high school. And then my mom stayed a whole extra week with me since she knew I got let go and was like helping me with the wedding planning and doing a bunch of stuff like getting decor and all that stuff. And so like my support system is incredible. My girlfriends bought me a plane ticket to come home for my bridal shower and um, the bachelorette party and whatever, like my support system is great. I think it's just the ego hit and my lack of self-confidence and self-esteem in this instance, that's really just driving me to be self-destructive. Well, it's good for you to admit, but now you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta do something about it. Like we do this thing sometimes where, listen, they always say like the hardest part is to admit you have a problem, right? Admit the fault, yeah. right? I know that's often like a, a, a saying that's used when it comes to like addiction and I, I don't know anything about addiction, but I do think we have, as someone who's like a self-identified ruminator, I think sometimes we hear the hardest part is admitting we have a fault. Yeah. And we've heard that, I think everyone's kind of heard that on some version. So a ruminator, me being a ruminator, you being a ruminator, I think us ruminators give ourselves way too much credit for identifying the thought. And we like to identify the thought so that we can ruminate on it. And so it's like, oh, well, I know I don't have a lot of confidence in this issue and this situation ruined my confidence. So what am I going to do about it? And you just ruminate over and over about your lack of confidence and how like you're a victim of this situation. And if you just go down the rabbit hole of like, well, all I wanted it was an answer and they couldn't even give me, they couldn't even give me that. And what am I supposed to do with that? And like, that's just shattering my confidence because it makes me like think I don't have an answer and yada, yada, yada. But like, you can acknowledge that you do have a habit of, of doing this. So you can name the problem and then you have to go another step further because sometimes once we name the problem, then we give ourselves permission to worry about the problem that we've identified and you got to go as a, like a self-identified like ruminator and someone who's constantly in your head, you have to go a step f- further when you identify the problem and ask yourself, all right, well, how am I going to address this problem? How, you know, what are some things I can do on my own? You know, obviously you mentioned therapy, which seems to be a bit of a challenge because you, you know, lost your insurance. I don't know your financial situation. Obviously you just lost your job. Yeah. I do want to point out for everyone listening, I don't know your financial situation. But like, I think sometimes when it comes to like medical stuff, we don't think we should ever go out of pocket. Yeah. It's like, oh, wait, I don't have insurance. I can't do it. And again, you lost your job. You're paying for a wedding. Money, I have, I have no doubt is tight. Right. But depending on the therapy session, like it could be a hundred bucks, could be maybe 250 bucks. That's a, could be a lot of money. And again, don't know what you're spending your money on. I am just here to point out that if you thought that you were really would be in great benefit of therapy and despite you not having insurance or a job, again, maybe there's money you're spending in other places that you could not spend and invest in a therapy out of pocket, even though you don't have insurance. Again, yeah. I don't know your financial situation and maybe that's not available to everyone. I am just saying that sometimes we have this attitude that if we don't have the insurance to cover the thing that we want, then we can't get it. And that's not true. You could pay for it. And sometimes afford is a relative term. We have a harder time spending $200 on therapy than we do like, you know, shirts and shoes Mm -hmm. and handbags and cars and things like that. Or like, you know, trips. It's no fun spending $250 an hour on therapy. It's way more fun going to the like Las Vegas and putting 250 bucks on black, you know? (laughs) Yeah. You know, and you could, that's true. Yeah. So if you really think therapy is going to benefit you, like maybe it's just like something you do in the short term and, and decide and, and budget accordingly. 
just a thought. I thought about too, um, my fiance was going to see if maybe I could be added as like a domestic partner or something there you go. on his insurance. I, I don't know if that's depending on the insurance. I don't know if that's allowed, but um, otherwise, I don't know, maybe I could pull from my savings or something like that. I mean, yeah, obviously I don't money's tight. I don't have a lot of money coming in, but I can figure something out. And thankfully he has been so supportive in trying to be like, I got you. Like, you don't have to worry. Like we are all here to help you. We're not going to let you fall in your face, but I think it's more so my ego and my like hyper independence of being like, I don't want to, I don't want to depend on anyone. You know, I want to be able to bring in my own money or, you know, whatever. Like, well, you can bring in your own money, but like, I don't, why are you getting married? Genuine, genuine question. Like, why are you getting married? I want to spend my life with him and just be happy and grow a life together and but what do you like what do you together sure and adventures are great but what do you hope to do for him and what do you hope to get from him you didn't just get married because you want to go on adventures no no but that's but but i'm serious like we we i don't think we think about that like what you want potentially this guy to be your husband and yet you're so resistant for him taking care of you at all like why are you letting your ego like I'm all for you being independent. Like, and I, right. I love it when yeah. Natalie like has her own independent things and I find independence, you know, just I'm a guy and I, I'm a heterosexual man. So, but I find independence in women and, and, and women who are career motivated personally, just a personal thing for me. I find that mm-hmm. to be sexy and attractive, you know, right. but I also like taking care of the people I love. Yeah. I get being independent and not counting on people, but there's yeah. people and then there's like your husband. That's different. You yeah. know? No, that's true. I've always been, and then I get, I think this is part of like the childhood trauma of being made to feel like a burden. And that kind of has always stuck with me in the way of like, not wanting to have to depend on people and feel like a burden to others. And, but you're right. I mean, that is true. Like being able to rely on one another when things are hard and one partner being able to step up and carry the other. Cause I mean, I've had to do that for him before too. We've been together for almost six years. And you, and you will again. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how it might not be in the, in the, in in like from a financial term, there's a million different ways we can step up and care for the people we love. You know, sometimes it's financially, sometimes it's emotionally, sometimes it's both some, you know, I don't know, goes on and on and on. Someday, if you guys like stand the test of time, you'll be wiping, someone's going to be wiping the other person's ass, you know, like, (laughs) you know, I don't know. Yeah. But like, that's supposed to be the point of of getting married, you know, before you blow up your whole life and walk away from an engagement where you have nothing bad to say about your partner, maybe just take a pause and just take it for what it is. I lost a job and me losing that job makes me feel a certain way about my confidence. But at the end of the day, it doesn't define me. Like your marriage to the, your fiance and this job are, are just not really connected at all. And yet you're, yeah. you're act like, well, we got married the same week and I offer the job. So like, if the job sucks, then the, I guess the marriage might as well. There's no like, I think simple... it just got overshadowed. Yeah. Yeah. And the wedding that your fiance is taking an extra job, like good for you. Listen, we spent more than we anticipated on our wedding and I had a lot of thoughts on it, but like, I'm glad we did it. And it was a memory I have. Mm-hmm. That being said, like you can always cut back, you can always spend right. less, you know? So yeah. every problem that you are, you know, losing your mind over or ruminating, you can instead try to figure out how to solve the problem rather than letting it snowball into something that is a, that is bigger than it actually is. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Yeah. And my fiance has even said all of these things. I think it's just hard to take the advice of people that are closest to you when sure. you're going through, you know, your crisis and <laughs> Your, your mind is just racing and how do I process everything and come out of it on the other side? Because I know that a lot of it is 10% of what happens to you and 90% how you'd react to it. And right now I feel like I'm failing at the how you react to it part, but I don't want to be that way. Sure. I would start by instead of like questioning your entire relationship, I don't know if you've done this already, but like maybe just say, you know, hey, to your partner, thank you for allowing me to be able to count on you. Like you've really been like a rock for me. And honestly, like it's really helped me because right now you seem to be so resistant to it because Mm -hmm. you're letting counting on him make you feel like more of a loser. Yeah. It's not allowing you to appreciate him in a way that you should appreciate him, which is to be there for you. You know, thank you for being here for me. Like it's really helped. Like I, I couldn't do this without you. So thank you. Like, 
It means a lot that we can count on each other. I promise to be there for you in the future when you need me and I'm in a better place. But thank you for being there for me. Like, say that to them. Yeah. It'll mean a lot, you know, because yeah. like when we do yeah. step up for the people we love, we do want them to notice it and appreciate it. But you're too busy feeling sorry for yourself. You're not even allowing him to do the thing he's trying to do. You're, you're pushing it away. You're kind of like, ugh. Yeah. Uh, I don't need yeah. you to uh. allow your partner to be the partner that he wants to be. That's why he signed up for it. I'm assuming be gra grateful of that. Mark it down so that you can return the favor in the future when need be. And then show gratitude that like, despite me not being where I'm at professionally, how lucky I am to have someone who still loves me and supports me and is my rock because there are literally Tens of thousands of people listening to this show, men and women, who are like, fuck my job. I just wish I had a partner like she's describing. Yeah, no, that's true. And I, I think it's really hard when I'm so down and, you know, anxious or depressed or whatever that I, I know that something I need to work on is, you know, having gratefulness. Well, uh, hopefully this was helpful. Uh, yeah. It doesn't sound like maybe you should call off the wedding. Yeah, no, I know. I, I don't think I should either. He, I mean, he had said like, we can, if you want, until you wait, until you get, you know, in a better headspace. But like life is going to keep happening and things are going to keep happening. Yes. Shit happens. And like, you can't allow yourself to snowball every time and make a bad situation worse by pity, pitting yourself. Totally. So, yeah. All right. I agree. Yeah. Thank all you right. so much. I really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. On getting married and river and everything. Thank really you. It. Well, we'd love yeah. for you to check in and hopefully, you know, maybe you've implemented some of these, uh, things and maybe you're hopefully able to jump into therapy and i'd love for you to follow up with us and let us know how you've been able to redirect a lot of your energy i mean you honestly not like you remind me a lot of myself in a lot of ways and i can i assure you that most of your problems you can fix by just like changing the way you see the world and like getting better at policing your thoughts and yeah. life's getting to get a lot better so Good luck. I definitely will check in. Thank All you right. so much All for right. everything. Take care. All, All right. Bye-bye. Right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Grammarly. Grammar. It's important. It's also hard. It's also very important not to mess up, but now you can write with confidence with Grammarly. Grammarly is an AI writing partner that helps you get your work done faster with high quality writing for better projects, proposals, presentations, and more. Listen, if you're like me, you're dyslexic, or maybe you're just like very busy and you don't have time to proofread everything, stop letting people you're sending information to or emails think that you are dumber than you are because you have a typo here or there. Let Grammarly help you and your team save so much time and sound more professional more often. I mean, also with the tone setting feature that they have, it's really important to maybe send the right tone and let Grammarly, again, do that work for you. Grammarly helps you write stronger and with more impact. 96% of Grammarly users report that Grammarly helps them craft more impactful writing. And Grammarly works across 500,000 apps and websites. Get personalized writing suggestions. Get more done. Save time with one click and go from editing drafts in hours to seconds. 93% of professionals using Grammarly Premium report that it has helped them get more work done. Grammarly is the gold standard of responsible AI with 15 years of best-in-class communication trusted by tens of thousands of professionals and IT departments. Departments. Get AI writing support that works where you work. Sign up and download for free at Grammarly.com slash podcast. That's G-R-A-M-M-A-R-L-Y dot com slash podcast. Easier said, done. There's a lot of decisions you have to make when you have a baby. And the one that I feel the most comfortable and safe making is using Huggies for our daughter, River. I always tell Nick that when River's crying, she's trying to tell us something. And that's the case with most babies. They express it through cries. And so we've turned to Huggies. The new Huggy Skin Essentials are here. A brand new dermatologist approved line of diapers, wipes, and pull-ups training pants that are all designed with baby sensitive skin in mind. Their wipes are so thick and pH balanced to help maintain healthy skin. Their wipes have zero harsh ingredients, for a great gentle clean. The Skin Essential Diapers features the Skin Protect Liner, which is what helps take care of the ick and stick that can cause rash. They have this liner built in their diapers. The whole diaper helps protect against the top two causes of rash by managing moisture and runny mess. The liner gives you the barrier to help absorb moisture and lock away runny mess from baby skin. Pull-Up Skin Essentials has your big kid covered too with a training pant that is ultra soft and breathable to help protect sensitive skin through potty training. Learn more at Huggies.com once again, head to Huggies.com to learn more. How's it going? Hi, my name is Kelly. I'm 25 and I need help navigating how to tell my sister who was happy that I had a miscarriage that I'm pregnant again. Oh my 
God. Well, first of all, why was she happy you had a miscarriage? So to give you a little bit of context, my sister is older than me. Okay. And about two and a half years ago, so I'm engaged now to my fiance. And when we just started dating, a couple months into dating, we found out that we were unexpectedly pregnant. And I come from a really strong Catholic family. Uh, yes. So I called my sister, my older sister, and I was like, I need to confide in somebody. And at first she was really kind and supportive. And I actually lived across the country from my home state at the time. So all of this was over the phone. And then when I came home to see her in person, she had expressed to me that her and her fiance had felt that me and my boyfriend were kind of cutting in line in the family. And her as the oldest child had always felt like she would have the first kid in the family. So she wanted to be the trailblazer. And she kind of expressed a lot of anger toward me being pregnant. Wow. It was a lot for me to take on. When people say brutally honest, that is what they mean. Because <laughs> yeah. that is some brutally honest shit. So to clarify, you got pregnant. Your sister, you reached out to. And at first, your sister did, I guess, the right thing, which is to just be supportive. Then, unfortunately, sadly, nature decided otherwise. You had a miscarriage. You let your sister know. And now that she was, I guess, in the clear and you were no longer with child, she used that as an opportunity to set you straight so that in case you were thinking about getting pregnant again, she wanted you to know that hold on, bitch, I'm the oldest <laughs> and it's my like, what, birthright or something? And that she- and actually it's worse because she told me that before I miscarried. I actually ended up having a miscarriage about a week after she said that to me. Oh my God, even worse. Yeah, it was. And I, at the time, I didn't have much emotional energy to entertain it. I kind of just listened to her feelings. And, you know, I think that maybe that's an internal feeling that most people would probably never say out loud. But it's a feeling most people would even have. Yeah. And I think that's where I struggled because I just can't relate to that feeling. And I mean, I'm a middle child, so I've never done anything first. So my sister saying that to me, it was like, I can't even relate to that. Like a lot of times I can sit back and hear people's thoughts and be like, okay, I can understand where that's coming from. But this just wasn't one of them. One could argue that she literally wished it upon your unborn child to not exist. And that's, that's a dark, sinister thought. Yeah, what did she say? I did miscarry well, because yeah, then it, I yeah. think she felt a little bit bad because she kind of brought it into existence. A, a bit. little? Yeah. She never apologized to me. She's my sister. So when I miscarried, we kind of had a brief conversation. I told her that I miscarried and we just, we've never talked about it. And I've never expressed to my sister how much it hurt me, what she had said. I just, at the time I was like, I have too much yeah. other feelings that I'm struggling with that that's not a priority for me right now. Good on you to know that a lot of people wouldn't be able to control themselves. How long ago was that? About two and a half years ago. Okay, so some time has passed. And what is your sister's relationship status? She just got married last year and they're probably, yeah, they're under six months of marriage. Are they trying to have a kid? So this is where maybe it gets a little bit complex and where my issue comes in. So my fiance, he's also the guy that I got pregnant with two and a half years ago. We're still together. We actually moved in together really recently after we miscarried. And now we're engaged and we're supposed to, well, we are getting married in the fall. And my sister told me about a month ago that they were going to start trying. And it just so happens that exact same month I found out I'm pregnant. Okay. And so now I don't know how to talk to my sister because of her last response. So unless she is magically pregnant right now, I feel like I'm in trouble. Well, you're not. So your sister, first of all, yeah. I know you're saying that as a figure of speech, but sometimes I think we allow those thoughts to actually become our reality. You're not in trouble. She's your sister. She's not your mom. And even if she was your mom, you're an adult woman who clearly has the right to have a child if you want. I can't speak to how your sister's going to react to this, but you do not have to give a shit or you do not have to have a reaction to whatever her reaction is. That's the thing you'll have to, to work on. I mean, the arrogance of your sister to expect that everyone wait for her to figure her shit out is fucking wild. I just got married recently. My brother got engaged and then eloped and got married with a matter of less than a month or two. I don't know. I don't, I should probably know. But one day he, we got sent a couple pictures being like, I'm married. And it was like a month before our wedding. I couldn't imagine like somehow making that moment about me, Be like, how dare you? Like we're about to get married and you just decided to get a married. Like, that's like what your sister's doing, but like actually not as bad because what your sister did is yeah. far worse. 
regarding the like the life of your unborn child <laughs> it's fucking crazy i think that's where it gets complex too is because none of my actions in my life are calculated but my sister can sometimes take that and she can twist things a little bit and she might think i got pregnant despite her or like that's not reality and it can be hard to talk to my sister she's not the most as logical person sometimes and she can be a bit re- reactive so for me to so does anyone know yet i can't put my life on pause like you said does anyone no, know you were you, but the vile files is the first people to know. Obviously, my fiance, but I'm I do find it funny How far along are you? This is my Congratulations, by the way. It's it's like all... six weeks. We okay, are, so we very time. new. Like, I want you not wasting a, a second worrying about what your sister is going to say. That stress you don't yeah. need. It's not that I care as much as what my sister is going to say. I just don't want it. And she's a little bit persistent with her opinions. And I don't want her to suck the joy out of this season with, I guess, whatever she's going to bring me. Who was aware of this in your family? Not your pregnancy. Uh, what my no. sister said. Yeah, what she did, that whole, the whole drama around it. So I never told a soul, but my fiance knows because I've expressed how it's hurt me to him, but no one knows the depth of what my sister said to me. I mean, what do you think is the best approach? And I guess, what is that why you're calling it? Are you trying to figure out how to approach this, what you should do? Like, what's, like, how can I be helpful? I want to figure out a way to tell my sister without hurting her and damaging our relationship further, but also not taking away from being happy in a time that I am really happy and I'm really excited. Write her a letter. You think that? A slow burn? Why Why is that a slow burn? I feel like I don't have to face her, so maybe it's like a cop-out for me. I'm not suggesting you like write her 17 different emails that slowly <laughs> tell a story and drip the information. Writing a letter is always nice because obviously this is emotional for you. Right. And then when we jump into emotional conversations, we can get sidetracked and easily get distracted and feel like we didn't say what we really wanted to say. And sometimes the conversation could get derailed, especially by people who make it about themselves and yada, yada, yada. So a letter allows you to just kind of get your thoughts out without you getting all that worked up, hopefully, which obviously with you being pregnant is a primary concern. Don't know how she's going to respond, but hopefully it gives her a chance to not be as reactive because I guess she can pick up the phone and text you right away and 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 say whatever's crossing her mind. But there's also a chance that whatever feeling she has, even if it's anger or sadness or whatever, that she might be reactive by herself. And then calm the fuck down and then maybe read what you had to say. Yeah, that is a good point. I think that her having more time to process might help her. I think her and her husband feed off each other a little bit because he, I know that she seemed very kind and supportive when I talked to her. And then I think when she reflected with him is when a lot of these feelings came up. Maybe it's all his fault. But at the end of the day, like, I love Natalie, but if Natalie somehow, like this example I gave you about my brother getting married, if Natalie somehow took exception to my brother getting married before us, I would not have allowed her to warp my mentality. And at the end of the day, your, your, your sister is an adult woman who has her own agency and thoughts and opinions. She can disagree with her husband and she can push back and she could defend her sister and she can say that's ridiculous. She had the opportunity to bring life in this world and like who cares who's first, second, third or last. Like we're going to be happy for her because she's our she's my baby sister. Like she could have done that. I know it might even be you easier for you to like kind of blame him and let your sister off the hook, but like I think more like you. Like I would love to be pregnant with my sister. I would be so happy for my little sister if she was pregnant so i think i need to take a step back from i guess feeling responsible for her reaction and just take myself out of it all i can do is tell her and then hope she can find a way to be at peace with that yeah i mean you're not responsible for her reaction and you did Mm -hmm. nothing wrong and i hope that goes without saying but yeah i really think you just write a letter you can always rewrite a letter that you haven't sent there's that do you think i should tell her that I was hurt by what she said or Absolute. do you think I should let all that go? Oh, no, 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 no. Real simple as always, you lead with love. Hey, yeah. I want you to know more than anything, I love you. And you are my big sister. I don't know how you feel about her, but if there's some versions of like, I've looked up to you, like not only you're my sister, but like, you know, I consider you as my friend and someone I go to advice, like my, our relationship matters to me. So you start with some version of that. And then you go into, which is why I wanted to write you, because obviously I haven't really addressed, you know, like what happened with us in the past. But like, 
it was hurtful and it was a lot to process. And I couldn't help but have some like residual feelings about like, you know, obviously you're not blaming her. You want to make it very clear, but like, it was just, it was hard for you to hear your sister not be happy for you and suggest that you had to plan your life around hers. And that doesn't seem right or okay. And then you tell her that, yes, this was hurtful. This is how it affected me. I love you regardless. And I, you know, obviously I'm writing you because I want to have a relationship with you, but I'm also writing you to let you know that I am pregnant and I'm incredibly happy and we're incredibly happy. And you don't have, don't ex feel like you need to explain to her why you're pregnant or your decision. I know that you, and then you could say, I know you and Matt, or I don't know what your brother-in-law's name is or whatever. I know you mentioned you were trying, so I can't help but be very nervous to tell you because of how you reacted last time. My hope is that you can support me this time around and be happy for us as I would be happy for you. The moment you tell me that you're pregnant, I'm going to be joyous. And I hope that we can, you know, someday be pregnant together. I hope I can be there for you and I hope you're there for me. But like, I just want you to know as my sister who I love, like this is how this felt. And I'm really hoping that we can grow from here. And you keep it generally positive, but you absolutely express how she made you feel. Yeah, I think that's a good idea because it's been two years and it still weighs on my chest. Like they always say, if you're mad, go to bed. If you're still mad, then bring it up. But I do. I love my sister and we are close. And that's, I think, a bit why it caught me so off guard. So I do think that it would be worth addressing. And I do want to go with love because I don't, I don't hate my sister. I don't, I not even super mad at her. I just, I feel hurt because I love her and I want to be loved back by my sister. Yeah. You can mention that like, it, like it was really hard to hear what you said to me and then never have you apologize for it. And now I can't help but feel guilt about my own pregnancy again for how you might react. And I just don't think that's fair. And I'm really hoping that's not how you feel this time around. And I'm really hoping that you're happy for us because obviously I'd be happy for you, but I'm worried to tell you. And this is why I'm writing to you because more than anything, I need to protect my mental health and my baby. And I want to keep the energy, nothing but positive. I really like the way you worded that. Yeah, I can do it. <laughs> you can. I think I'm scared of her a little bit. <laughs> what? I understand because you're a big sister, but like realistically and practically speaking, what are you afraid of? I think I don't like to cause waves in my family. I think middle children in general are a lot of times like the peacekeeper. Sure. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And so. But you can work on that. I think. Yeah. And I, I've been really working on setting boundaries because I, I'm not a practicing Catholic. I've kind of been a little bit steered away from it. So I've been navigating. Like I lived with my boyfriend before we got married. Sure. Obviously, I got some pushback from my family. Are you married now? No, we're getting married in October. Okay, yeah. Which, Great. Yeah, so well, I know you and Natalie have experience with how, how And how, how, how have your parents uh, handled, you know, you're living in sin, I guess. I don't know. Do they, do they yeah, care? I, I've been told I'm living in sin. But um, the thing is, they tell me how they feel, but then my mom also helped me move in. So it's a, it is a balance of like, I can respect where those values are coming from yeah. and I understand where they feel, but they always show up for me. Yeah. So. They'll, and they'll, they'll get over it. Is your sister a practicing Catholic? So my older sister is not, they did get married in a Catholic church. Like they follow, I guess, the appearance of the religious no, so family go, but so they baptize and go to church on easter and christmas and but they're not they have like they don't go to church on sundays so they're not and they also did live together before they got married so your sister loves I've the optics been, yes they do but which so we've been we're not getting married in a church and ironically before we got pregnant we actually were eloping so it kind of works out for our own traditional plan that we're not doing like a walk down the aisle in front of everybody because I'm a little nervous about being pregnant at my own wedding, but we are eloping and then we're having a reception later. Okay. That's awesome. So. You have nothing to be afraid of your sister. Like the worst thing that can happen is she could, you guys could, you know, not talk for a while and there'd be distance and that mm -hmm. would be sad, but like nothing to be afraid of, you know, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. 
you know, that fear that you say, that's kind of like, again, not a therapist, but like, I'm guessing like Darlene, my therapist would be like, that's your inner child kind of being afraid of your bigger sister when you were younger and her like laying down the law. And clearly she has no problem playing the role of bigger sister. I would practice you, you know, having no issue telling her back that you're not interested in what she thinks or feels, but you, you are open to always receiving her love and support. And I think that's where I've tried to push back where this is a little bit of I guess a tangent but she wasn't really happy with us eloping and when I pushed back it did not go very well how so and what do you mean when we decided we wanted to elope we wanted it to just be our parents and when my sister got out she called me and she told me that she pretty much thought it was like a big f you to everyone who's ever supported us and when I told her that it wasn't about her, she got really defensive and said that she's not allowed to have feelings. And <laughs> I just, I'm like, job. I don't know how to say that it's not about you without hurting your feelings when it's not about you. Well, also, she's, she's allowed yeah. to have her feelings hurt. It doesn't mean you did anything wrong. I mean, that's the thing about like people like, well, oh, I'm not allowed to have feelings. No, you're allowed to have feelings. I just like, don't care. <laughs> you know, and then I, you don't say that yeah. because she won't take it. I don't. Do you watch Vanderpump? I've been using this a lot lately. I don't, but I know everything just because of your podcast. Yeah. In the last episode, Ariana, on the, you know, uh, I've been going on and on about it because her friends are voicing frustrations about some of her choices, some of her boundaries of not interacting with certain people, and it's been frustrating to some of her friends, and it's been inconvenient to some of her friends, and when her friends at this reunion express these feelings. She was calm, like kind of how I want you to be. She, she validated their feelings. She didn't even argue against. She wasn't like, no, you're wrong for feeling that way. I'm right because I was the one who hurt and this isn't about you. She didn't say that. She was just like, no, like I hear you. That, those are valid. Like you're valid for feeling that way. I just like, it doesn't change how I'm going to go about making my choices for myself and what's best for my happiness and my mental health. And I respect your choice. I disagree with your choice, but you're entitled to your choice and you're happy to feel how you want, but it's not going to change how I go about things. And that's why I need you and what I want you to do is let your sister feel. She can be upset. She can be sad. You can validate, but like, I understand how you feel. Those are valid feelings, but like, this is something we needed to do for ourselves. And while it wasn't our intention, I'm sorry that you felt this way. Which is, I know, if people are just like, you know, the semantics of an apology, technically that's not a real apology. But you're also not apologizing for something you're not sorry for. You are acknowledging her feelings. So that way she can't say to you, well, you, you know, why am I not allowed to have feelings? Like, no, you were totally allowed. It makes a lot of sense. I can understand why you might feel that way. Just know it wasn't our intention. And while you feel this way, just so you know, and you can even admit this in the nicest possible, hopefully not totally condescending way. Is this like, yeah, like I will acknowledge that when we were planning our wedding, our first thought wasn't you. When we get, looked at our situation, we made the best decision for ourselves because obviously, you know, when we're getting married, that's ultimately what it comes down to. And you know, you know what I'm saying? You just like someone like your sister, don't match her emotion or her energy. You have to like almost just articulate calmly, you know, the crazy that she's saying, right? And allow yeah. her to allow her to uh, validate her feelings, allow her. Yeah, you're totally right. That, that makes a lot of sense how you feel that way. I just don't feel the same. Yeah. And that can be hard. That's what I'm really working on is because a lot of my family doesn't feel the same way as me, but I do think that just validating their feelings is a good way to go about it because sometimes I do try to defend myself or I try to explain why I'm trying to do things, but that's really hard to do when they're not going to ever think the same way as me. Yeah, especially when it comes to your like, you know, family dynamics and like deciding not to like, you know, live your life the way your parents raised you or practice certain religions that maybe the rest of your family, you don't need to explain shit. This like at the end of the day, it doesn't affect them how my household is ran, if it's ran with love and Exactly. It's healthy and happy. And short of your family, and even if they were to, which I don't think it should change your decision, but even, like short of them disowning you, like that could be devastating for anyone. But that hasn't happened yet. And it doesn't seem like it's going to. But every decision you make, you're almost acting as if it's possible that they could. Uh, my parents wouldn't, but I feel like my sister... <laughs> your sister's a bit of a bully bullies operate under like intimidation and threats and the reason why your sister does what she does is because you react and the moment you stop reacting you she will probably stop doing 
what she does, but she is so used to getting a reaction out of you. It feeds her fire. And yeah, and it does get to me like she can probably sense that it actually does. Yes. Yes. And uh, I do care how she feels. And that's, you know, I do want my sister to feel heard and feel validated. But sometimes I just blatantly think she's wrong. Yeah. And that's okay. And you can say that and you can say, I care how you feel. But sometimes, sister, your feelings are not going to trump mine. And I want to be able to acknowledge your feelings and validate them because they are important. But that doesn't always mean I'm going to do what you want to do. You know, you don't have to like them, but I'm asking you to respect them. And I, I'm asking you to treat me like you would your sister, even though I, I don't often do things you agree with because you have to live your life and I have to live mine. The pettiest thing you should say in this letter, and I don't think you should really say it, but you can remind her that you don't remember the last time she called you up and asked for your input or permission more specifically of how she should live hers. Yeah, that's a very good point. That's all very helpful. And it's nice just to feel validated that. And I know I didn't do anything wrong and I don't feel any sort of shame or like I'm in a situation where I need to apologize. But it is nice just to have some, I guess, a voice of common sense in my ear of like, she's not in control of anything and her feelings are not my problem. I mean, unless you want to make them your problem because you care and you're empathetic. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. I'm getting married this year. You know, I pray everything goes healthy with this pregnancy. And but there's just so much positivity happening that I don't really have the energy or care to entertain that unless it's coming from a supportive and loving place. I think we really downplay the whole like kill with kindness and the power that it has. And it's shocking how little we utilize that, that gift and that power of killing people with love. So like your sister, who you're so afraid of, as you say, like the worst thing that we both came up with that she can do is basically give you the silent treatment and like, quote unquote, disown you, you know, which is basically her just ignoring you for a period of time and like talking shit about you to her mom and dad and your other sibling. Let's assume she does all that. You could still choose to every once in a while send a text or a letter just saying, I love you. I miss you. You could. You could do that. And yeah, your ego might be a little bruised by doing it and giving her the satisfaction. but like. That's power. Your ability to still send her I love you and still act as if nothing's changed, even though she is putting up this like huge fight and and not even talking to you. And yet you're still able to say, whenever you're ready, I love you. I'm not necessarily going to change how I feel. I'm not going to back down from my boundaries or expectations. But regardless, I'm okay with disagreeing with you and still loving you because you're my sister. Like, is she really just going to keep hating you for that? I think if she actually said out loud what has happened and the things she said, which I think she would be in a little bit of denial now about it, anyone listening would say that that's a little bit crazy. And I don't think that she has much power against me to really create an army. I think that she might vent a little bit to my family and they may entertain her a little bit, but eventually she'll get over it. And my family is not really a bunch of bandwagoners. Like, they are all pretty have independent feelings. The whole family's not going to turn on me. I'm not really worried about that. Yeah, it's going to be fine. I don't think I did anything evil. I don't think give her the power. Yeah, and that, this is coming down to you not giving her the oxygen and power. All your fears, while valid, they're only going to happen if you manifest them. Like before you called in and you're like, you had all these things of what you could do. And one option was to like basically call her up not really to let her know what she did, but seek her approval one more time, only to not get it. Like that was a scenario that you could have done. My other thought was just to hide my baby for the rest of my life. <laughs> Another crazy idea. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's just me being, maybe being a little bit of a, like an avoidant of the conversation that. Yeah. But still I giving her power. Her reaction. And, and to, yeah. you know, I think about this all the time. Every time I'm thinking about questions with Nick and the things I say to you guys is like the energy is a tangible thing. And yet we often dismiss it as such. Your energy, the amount of time that you think about anything isn't limitless. And if you were to listen, I mean, I know you're kind of joking, but let's just say for, pre you know, for argument's sake that you were to quote unquote, at least for a period of time, hide your pregnancy, you know, avoid telling her. You know how much energy that would take you? Yeah, it would weigh on my chest every day. Every day. And I think yeah. we often discount that by telling ourselves it's easier to avoid, to avoid, to avoid. Well, to avoid takes energy every day to continue to hide, avoid, to not address the issue. That eats away at us. We could be doing so much more with that energy, even if that was just being at peace. And I want to be at peace. And that's why I think like 
when the time comes and everything is healthy with this pregnancy, I would just want to rip the bandaid off. This is nothing but a joyful thing. You have nothing to worry about. You're not afraid of your sister. Like what she is, if anything, is annoying. That's it. And all our siblings can be annoying. Your sister's currently being annoying. It's not a you problem. That's a her problem. So stop making her problems yours by taking on, you know, her baggage and worrying for her. So when you write this letter, don't do the thing where every sentence you write, you're thinking like, well, how is she going to receive this? Is this, is this worded perfectly? Lead with love. Don't be mean. And then read it, you know, read it back to yourself after you write it and ask yourself, am I, go- am I, att- am I venting? Or am I communicating? If you're venting, maybe try again. You know, if yeah. you're communicating and also always, every time you even, even when you are venting, are you always bringing it back to a place of ultimately, what do you want out of this letter? That message should be, I want to have a sister and I want to have a healthy relationship with you. And while we're not always going to agree, I still always want you in my life. And I want to feel like we have mutual respect. You're not writing this letter to get the perfect response. You are writing this letter to finally get out what you've been holding on for so long so that you can move forward with your pregnancy with peace. And whenever your sister's ready, which I doubt will be right away, she'll communicate with yeah, you. Yeah, especially if she's not pregnant. Yeah, she'll communicate with you. And maybe when yeah. she first communicates with you, it won't be the uh, reaction that you hoped for, but it's still not your problem. The more you can sound like that, unbothered, chill as fuck, and totally at peace with your decision, I promise you, she'll, you'll win. You won't give her a choice. Yeah, I think you're right. Weirdly enough, I don't know, maybe it's just me being a product of having Ted siblings, but like this is the thing I'm yeah. talking to you about is the thing, like I've never struggled with this. This is something that's always come natural to me. And I hope I can pass this gift on to you, the middle child who, who does struggle with this. But I can just assure you, they're still going to be your brother and sister. You know, they're not going anywhere. The benefit of knowing that like at the end of the day, they're kind of stuck with you and vice versa. So just keep loving them and they'll figure it out and let them work through their bullshit. All right. Congratulations yes. uh, on your pregnancy. Thank you. Super happy for you and the upcoming wedding. Super happy for you. All that matters is that you and your fiance are aligned. None of that matters. None of the, you, yeah, you know, we're solid over here. Yeah. So that is all that matters. Keep focusing on that. Don't let these people like take away your energy and just like, I can't stress enough. I'm just a broken record, but just the more you can acknowledge one's feeling, while still enforcing your boundaries, you'll be a force to be reckoned with if you can do that. Thank you. I'm going to work on that. <laughs> All right. Take care. Keep us posted. I'd love to know yeah, how this conversa- conversation with Big Sis goes. All right. Well, thank you so much. All right. My pleasure. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Summer is officially here, and it's the perfect time to get out of the house and go to that concert or event you've been thinking about. Maybe your favorite artist is back on tour. Now is the perfect time to go do something. That's why we need to tell you about our special hookup from today's sponsor, SeatGeek. Listen, we got last minute seats to Harry Styles from SeatGeek. Loved. Thank you, SeatGeek. They're iconic. Everyone can use our code VIALL10 and get 10% off any tickets at SeatGeek, whether you're a new customer or not. Sports, concerts, festivals, you name it. There are so many artists touring right now, including Billie Eilish. Hosier, Noah Kahan, Zach Bryan, we saw him, thanks SeatGeek, and SeatGeek has you covered. Each ticket is rated on a scale of 1 to 10, so look for the green dots. Green means good, red means bad. Every ticket is backed by their buyer guarantee, and SeatGeek is the only site that lets you return your tickets ahead of the events with swaps. No matter how many times you've bought tickets using SeatGeek before, VIALL10 is going to get you 10% off your next order. So take out your phone, open the SeatGeek app, and add code VIALL10 to your account. What are you waiting for? Do it now because this offer is only available for a limited time. Guys, uh, can we talk about mattresses? You've heard us talk about Helix before, and we're never going to shut up about how fantastic their mattresses are. But not just their mattresses, also their pillows. Mm. I had a pillow that I literally pushed my daughter out of. It was behind my head, and I have such a special connection to it. It was literally the best thing ever. Nick left it in the hospital, but I did order another one, and it's good as new. Yes, obviously. Also, we are on our way to the lake next week, and we refuse to go there until we got new Helix mattresses that are en route to the lake right now because we refuse to sleep on anything other than Helix, especially when in the comforts of our homes. If you need to know which one it is that we're talking about, it is the Moonlight mattress, but they also have award-winning 
award-winning luxe and ultra-premium elite collections. The Helix Plus is a mattress designed for big and tall sleepers, and the Helix Kid mattress is designed for growing bodies and endorsed by child sleep experts. <laughs> it's super easy. You just go online, take a quiz, and you are paired with the right mattress for you. Helix knows there's no better way to test out a mattress than to sleep on it in your own home. That's why they offer a 100-night trial and 10 to 15-year warranty depending on the mattress. If you don't want to take our word for it, don't worry. Helix has been awarded the number one mattress picked by GQ and Wire Magazine and is recommended by multiple leading chiropractors and doctors of sleep medicine as a go-to solution for improving your sleep. Helix is offering up to 30% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash V-I-A-L-L. That is helixsleep.com slash V-I-A-L-L. With Helix, better sleep starts now. How's it going? Good. What's your name? My name is... Ava, and I'm 32 years old. How can we help, Ava? I'm wondering if I should cut my grandma off, oh. if I'm in the right or not. <laughs> when we want to cut off Gam Gam? Why do we want to cut off grandma? It's kind of a long story, but um, I have four kids. Okay. And over spring break, my grandma, which is their great grandma, wanted to have my oldest daughter stay with her for like the whole week. Okay. And she was taking her to a sewing class that they were doing together. Mm -hmm. She also wanted all my kids to come on one of the days, okay. all four of them. And I was okay with it. I didn't ask her to watch my kids. She wanted to. The night before the day that she was supposed to have all my kids for a sleepover, she called me and asked if I could make sure to give my nine-year-old son um, his ADHD medication and if I could send it with him. But... We only medicate him when he's in school, and she knows that because it has side effects that I don't like, and I'm really only doing it so that the school will keep him in regular classes. So she... Wait, the school, like, requires him to take this medication? Yeah, kind of messed up. It's been a whole thing, but he's not, like, a bad kid or anything like that. He's not hard to handle. So I told her, like... I'm no just kind grandma. of blown away that a public school system... Is this public school? Yeah. A public school is enforcing a kid no, to take... No, not enforcing, but it's just the only way that we have been able to help him with his doctor and everything. He just can't sit still. Okay. But he only takes it on school days. So on the weekends and everything, he doesn't because... You don't like it. He doesn't love it. You don't want him to be on it. Totally understandable. So she started freaking out. She was like, well, I guess I'll just try to deal with him. And I was like, well, you don't have to. And she just went on like this rampage about how every time he's there, he's just so much to handle and he's obnoxious and she doesn't know how she'll possibly handle it. And I told her, well, you've never seen him on his medication. First of all, every time I bring him there, he's not medicated and he's not that way. And if that's how you feel, then I guess you won't have them for a sleepover. Like you asked for this. Yeah. And she just went over the top. She started saying that I'm a bad mother. I'm the most negative person she's ever met. She doesn't know why my husband is still with me. They dread when we come over to visit. It was like five minutes of me just sitting in silence while my grandma said some of the worst things you could possibly say. Where's your mom in this equation? It's actually my dad's mom. My parents are divorced. So my dad and stepmom, my grandma is kind of always been like this, but she's never done it to me. They pretty much only go over there for holidays and stuff because she's really mean to my stepmom. So this was the absolute last straw because, of course, after this conversation, I called my dad. He called her, got in a fight with her, and they haven't spoken since either. So this is like around April 10th, I think. Well, cutting her off completely seems strong does uh, it okay cutting off grandma for the rest of her life seems unnecessary like why do you have to decide today whether you're going to cut her off forever what if grandma changes her tune what if she realizes that maybe she needs to be medicated you know and then comes down to planet earth i don't fucking know you know what i'm saying but i get your anger I get your frustration. Yeah. And given that grandma has a history of this behavior, I get where you're coming from by saying, well, listen, like this is called a spade a spade and I just don't want this type of person in my life. I guess what I'm saying is you can set the rigid boundary of limiting grandma access to you and your kids 
without coming to the finite decision of we're cutting off grandma forever. I'm not speaking to you anymore. You're done to us. You're dead to me. That's I know. That's, you know, that's where I'm really stuck. Yeah. Well, but I, I feel find, like some of the things find the middle said, ground. And the middle yeah. ground is to stand up for yourself and your children, to communicate the boundary. I'm assuming the boundary is you can't speak to me or my children that way. The second boundary is if you want to have access to my children, you have to follow our rules, not yours. And if you don't want to, yeah. it's totally fine. You know, we let you hang out with our kids because we want them to have a relationship with you. But like, if that's not conducive, to your lifestyle, you know, you're getting older, maybe, maybe this is too much for you, you know, totally fine. But either way, our kids, our rules. So that's this super rigid boundary. Hope you can respect it. And that includes when your kids do and don't take medication. You don't get to like make some of our kids feel included and some of our other kids feel excluded. You don't get to have Tommy and Sally over, but exclude Johnny and make Johnny feel like he's not normal. So we're just not going to have you have access to, to anyone. And again, totally understand. We're happy to bring the kids over. We're happy to have you come over, but maybe sleepovers is too much for you. Again, she's the one saying this is too much for me. Her words, not yours. But more importantly, you just say, listen, it's just really hurtful to say some of the things that you've said. I hope that you don't actually mean it. But if you do, obviously... I'm not looking to have that type of energy in my life. I hope these words are coming out of a, from a place of anger and you being upset. Either way, I love you. I forgive you. But nonetheless, I just can't have that type of energy in my life. The trick is you need to be able to get to the place to say this and communicate this without losing your fucking mind. Yeah. <laughs> but you can do it. It's, but, but here, here, here's what I understand. The alternative is you're literally cutting off grandma for life. So you are, you are, you called in with being like, should I cut this bitch off for life? <laughs> For life, forever, you know? So if you're willing to let her go forever, then why can't you just calmly point out your rules while giving her decision to decide whether she wants to follow them or not? The mm -hmm. alternative, you're just like, hey, I'm about to like cut you off for life. If you're willing to go to that extreme, why can't you calmly give her the option to, to mm -hmm. choose a different path? Yeah, she, I, she has hasn't reached out at all since that. Well, again, I, I don't think you need to rush to. Total acceptable response for, for you to like distance yourself from grandma for a period of time, let feelings cool, whatever. I'm, I'm just responding to your question, which is, should I cut off grandma forever? And I'm just saying, before you cut off grandma forever, maybe you communicate that boundary with her and see how she responds. Mm -hmm. That way you're okay. never, you're never cutting off grandma forever. You're just saying them's the rules you need to follow to have access to me and my children. And the moment you're able to follow them and respect them, you can, you can be a part of our lives until you do, you can't. And the choice is yours. It's not my choice. It's your choice. I'm not cutting you off. You are choosing not to be a part of our lives. If you can't respect our rules. You know, you can't say those things to me. I'm sorry you feel that way. Even if I felt that way, I wouldn't say it to you. I didn't sit there and, you know, but it was really hurtful for you to say what you said just because you simply, just simply because I didn't do what you wanted me to do seems unfair and unnecessary. But again, that's you, not me, not going to like, you got to get to a place where you don't let grandma who has a history of acting this way and being this way, say out of pocket things and letting it, why are you letting it bother you so much? It's my grandma. And she like practically said she hated everything about me. Yeah, that sucks. And that's really hurtful. Yeah. Oh, I, I, no, I expect you to be upset and hurt about it. I, I do. But how you communicate, you know, yelling at her and, and trying to, you know, you're hurt, I guess is what I'm saying. And you've heard the phrase hurt people, hurt people. And your mm -hmm. instinct is to try to hurt her back because she hurt you. And what I am suggesting is to not do that, is to yeah. acknowledge your hurt, I guess, accept your hurt and lead with love and treat her how, you know, the golden rule, right? Because trying to hurt her because she hurt you isn't going to get you anywhere. It's just going to create more animosity and hostility and make you cut off a woman who like honestly could die tomorrow. I know. You know, so like, let's not put that type of juju on, on you. Forgive grandma for having, for being this way. I don't know what type of trauma this uh, young lady 
experienced, you know, 60 years ago when she was 12 years old, but like knowing how things were, maybe it was some fucked up shit. I don't know. So give her grace and forgiveness knowing that she is the way she is probably for reasons you can't explain or understand or even have an insight to. That's not to excuse her actions. That's just to make you understand because right now you're literally thinking, how could my grandma say this to me? Well, clearly it's coming from a place of pain. So offer yeah. her grace as to why it might be the way that it is without have to fully understand it. You know, especially okay. if this is like, this is the way she's always been. Well, it's coming from somewhere and you're probably not going to figure out the where or the why, but all you can do is just accept it, give her grace and set boundaries that you give her the option to decide to do. Okay. And through the grace that you give her, that will hopefully ha- allow you to, again, you can be hurt, but stop you from wanting to hurt her as a rep- repercussion. Because that's where the whole, like, should I cut her off forever comes from. You want to hurt her. You want her to pay the consequences for how she made you feel about yourself and how you raise your children. And you're going to punish her by cutting her off. And a much healthier option is to not cut her off, but to, again, communicate the boundary, which gives her the option on whether she wants to have access to your kids. And that's not you doing it to hurt her. That's being a, a good parent. You know, love you, grandma, but we're not really concerned with what grandma needs. We're concerned about what the kids need. And if grandma wants a sleepover, I'm here to figure out how we can make that work, but not if it comes in the way of what my children need. And here's what my children need. So you need to respect that. You need to get on board with that. And when you do, we can have all the sleepovers you want. And if not, totally okay. They don't even really like sleeping over at your place. Uh, <laughs> I don't think you should say that, but you get what I'm saying. It really just comes down to, you know, how you come to these decisions and why you come to them, because this is really just protecting your heart and protecting your energy and not allow you to go down these toxic paths and not allowing grandma who says some mean and hurtful things that are coming from a place of pain and past trauma will make you feel less good about yourself. Okay. And then listen, if there's anything she said that was slightly triggering to you that you felt like maybe was more true than you wanted it to be, I don't know. You don't need to explain yourself to me. Well, then sure, like reflect. And and if you think you need to work on things, work on things. I don't know, you know, whatever, whatever those things might be. Is that helpful? Yeah, very helpful. Great. Yeah. Everyone else I've talked to is like too close to it. You know, like my dad and my husband are also really mad. So yeah, they have the right to be mad. To have somebody with a completely outside perspective. But trying to get grandma to pay the price for her actions is not going to be productive. Yeah. Right now, it doesn't seem like it's bothering her at all. That's totally fine. But again, you are focusing on whether she's bothered has more to do with punishing her. Yeah, that's true. Okay. When you get off the phone with me, the thing I want you focusing on is forgiveness and gratitude when it comes to grandma. Forgiveness being centered around the fact that you do not understand why grandma is the way she is, but you accept that it's probably a product of some trauma that you will never have insight to, that she probably never dealt with because therapy and taking care of your mental health wasn't that all big of a deal five years ago. And trying to teach an old horse new tricks is pretty tough. So we're just going to choose to forgive her for saying what she said and not allowing us to take it as truth, right? Your ability to forgive grandma for saying what she says gives you the permission to not take what she said seriously. Imagine like running into like one of your kids, right? You're, you take them to the playground and some little fuck of a kid comes up to you and I don't know, says all the things that grandma said to you. Would that bother you that much? Or would you be like, you're the little fucking dipshit kid. You don't even know who I am. You know what I'm saying? And that's how you need to see grandma. Okay. Right? Because grandma doesn't know better, it seems like. You would forgive this kid. You'd be like, oh, you're a little fuck. I don't know. But you don't know what you're talking about. Go on. Go forth in this world. So you need to not let grandma bother you by forgiving her for what she said. You don't have to forget. Forgetting is not enforcing the boundaries that clearly need to be enforced based off of this new information of how grandma acts. You're forgiving her because you're not going to allow it to affect how you feel about yourself. Because she has no real insight into as you as a person or a mother, and she's clearly projecting. And again, she's hurt. She's trying to hurt you. Let's not do the same thing back. And her wanting to care is you wanting her to hurt somehow by you not speaking. So mm-hmm. you say, hey, listen, I don't know where grandma's trauma is coming from, but I forgive her for saying this. She clearly is going through some stuff. Obviously, we want our distance from grandma. 
So if and when she's ever ready to have a productive conversation, she'll reach out. Until then, we're just going to forgive grandma for unfortunately being who she is. Okay. And just for my own peace of mind, yeah. mostly. Yeah. Okay. And when okay. grandma reaches out, you say, grandma, glad to hear from you. I love you. That being said, it hurt my feelings. And I, I totally forgive you. It's okay. But that being said, if she, again, when she asks to see the kids, you need to explain that, like, these are the rules. Mm -hmm. It's up to grandma to decide if she wants to play by them. You don't set boundaries to hurt people. You, you set boundaries to protect yourself and to protect your children. Your decision to cut her off isn't a boundary. It's revenge. Yeah, I didn't think of it in that way, but you're right. <laughs> Let her go. Let her do her thing. You wanted to cut her off anyway, so her maintaining your distance shouldn't bother you. The things she, she said came from a place of pain, not reality. And you know that. So let's forgive her for not having access to the same things that you had access to as a child because she's only hurting herself, right? Like she, she went from having a, a nice little sleepover with the grandkids to not speaking to the grandkids. Who does that hurt? Her. The grandkids and her? Yeah. Sure, the grandkids, but they, they'll be okay. They've asked one time about her and I didn't it's, really know how to I know. I promise them, you it bothers you more than it bothers them. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, they'll be okay. It's hurting grandma. What does she have? Half her friends are dead. Yeah, and I'm the only, she only has two grandkids and I'm the only one with children, so. Yeah, so again, that's where the empathy comes in, is that if she is, this is only of really affecting her and her inability to have the type of productive conversations you're able to have and reflect and her inability to process whatever trauma she's had to deal with is hurting her in the relationship she has at this stage of her life when she really shouldn't be stressing over this type of stuff. But that's her choice. And you can't choose her life for her. When she's ready to make healthy decisions, you're ready to like have her be a part of your life. But the choice mm -hmm. is hers. Okay. I think I can do that. All right. <laughs> well, let us know if there's an update. We, we'd love to know if yeah. how things yeah. happen in the future. But I will let you know if she reaches out and how the conversation goes. Okay. Really focus on forgiveness and, and still loving her. Yeah. That gives you the permission to not take what she said so seriously. Okay. Okay? Yes. All right. That sounds great. Thank okay. you. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to send in your questions at asknickatthevowelfiles.com. We'll see you tomorrow for Reality Recap. Bye. Hey guys, if you loved what you listened to, make sure you hit that subscribe button below. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.